Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome back yet to another late night live stream. It seems like the only time I can ever hop on and do these with you guys is late where I'm at, but it might be a different time of day for you around the world. Um, anyway, so as you saw in the title, we're talking about whether or not rigging out your camera makes it any better. And, you know, this is a funny question because I get it all the time as a comment on this channel. People saying, you know, why did you take this small camera and fully rig it out? It's meant to be small, light, portable. That's the whole point of a mirrorless camera or a DSLR. And I get that comment constantly. But believe it or not, I think there are two sides to this coin, right? There are probably some benefits to completely rigging it out and some benefits to keeping it light and small. So I'd love to talk about that and get your input on whether or not you know, you think it's worth rigging out, spending money, all that extra money on your rigging because sometimes you can spend more on the camera rigging than the camera body itself. So I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. So let's take a quick look at the chat, say what's up to everyone, and then we'll start diving into this. So what's up, Domino Stories? It's great to have you back. You always are in the live and I appreciate that. Um, Brian Barajas, how's, he, how's it going? Um, I'm sorry, I always mess everyone's names up, but... Uh, Hidaki Nomura. I'm terrible. Hello. Um, and Greg Jones. How you doing? Easy name. Um, welcome to the live stream, guys. So yeah, let's talk about rigging out cameras. So in a recent video I posted on this channel, we talked about the Canon M50. It's kind of an older camera. There's a Mark II of it now, but I completely rigged this camera out. I actually have it right here. And this is the rig build that I did with it. And if you've ever seen this camera before, the M50 is very small and light. It's a tiny camera, but you can build this thing out and you can't even tell that it's really an M50 anymore, which is really cool. Um, but yeah, I got this super cheap on eBay. I think it was about 380 bucks plus taxes and shipping. So super cheap, but this film's in 4K and 24 frames per second and 30 frames per second and it has decent autofocus and it's really light and small. So yeah, I mean, if you guys are looking for a second camera, you can pick these up used really cheap and it's not bad. And the color science of Canon, of course, is pretty good. So this camera, um, you know, I could have left it completely alone and not rigged it out, but there are so many different reasons to rig a camera out like this. So let's chat about that. One of the first things people ask is like, oh, you know, you rigged out that camera. You may have seen some of my other camera rig builds on this channel about like the Sony a7S, a7S II, a7S III. And I've done a bunch of cameras. And people will say, well, it's still the same camera. Like it's not any better. The image quality is the same. And there's some truth to that, right? It's still the same sensor, still the same camera body. It's not all set in this like super amazing you know, better image quality, but there's so many things when you rig out a camera that can improve it and help you get better footage. One of the first ones is adding an ND filter. So using a variable ND filter or a solid state ND filter like I have here, this is the new small rig mini map box. I just did like a full review of it in the last build. And by adding this, obviously I can keep my shutter speed where it needs to be at a 180 degree shutter speed and then I can still be wide open at like say f2.8 or even wider with a nice shallow depth of field. So immediately that does improve your image quality by using something like an ND filter, variable ND filter. Now that's obviously you don't have to use a matte box. You could use just a screw on variable ND filter, but there's so many uh, there's just so many benefits to using something like a matte box because it helps cut out a ton of unwanted flares from bright lights, the sun, uh, reflections, things like that. So throwing a matte box on there, of course, not only makes it look a little bit cooler, I'll admit everyone does it. And I think, you know, it helps clients, you know, look at you and think, okay, this is professional. Uh, but of course it has a ton of use case to it. So that's one of the main things I throw on the front of every camera every time is some sort of ND filter. And for the most part, I'm usually, I'm usually doing it inside of a matte box. All right, let's take a look at the comments. All right. So let's see. Um, Greg Jones says, can't mess mine up. Yeah. Easy name. <laughs> That's what we were talking about earlier. Uh, Domino story says, what do you think about the black magic pocket cinema camera 6k pro? 
It's a great camera. Yeah, so I've actually done a full review of the Pocket 6K Pro on this channel. So once this live stream is over, you know, feel free to go check that out. I have a, a good review of it. And honestly, the Pocket 6K Pro is probably one of the best cameras you can buy for the money. I mean, you're getting, you know, a mini cinema camera has great B-RAW, you know, Blackmagic RAW is beautiful, 6K resolution, obviously, and the built-in ND filters. Fantastic. You actually don't have to build that camera out very much to make it very usable. So uh, you do have to add a battery to it still. It's terrible battery life. Blackmagic, please, if you're listening, improve the battery life of your cameras. It's just terrible. <laughs> so, all right, let's see. Heidi K saying, you can just call me Hide. Thank you. Thank you. Making it easy for me. Um, all right. And Brian saying, if it's worth the results, yes, uh, worth rigging it out. If it's worth the results. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So we've got the ND filter on here. This one's a little bit different. I don't know if you guys um, have seen the two new map boxes from small rig. This is the mini one. I prefer it. Um, they do have a much larger one that I had and I don't have it anymore because honestly it was just huge. Like it was very bulky and large, which on a smaller camera, like most of us are shooting on these DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, it was just too bulky. The, the only benefit of the larger one is that it fit four by four, these square filters natively, whereas this one doesn't. I've actually 3D printed this little square to hold it in place. Um, I'll see if I can pull that out and show you guys what I'm talking about here. So yeah, so I 3D printed this little piece of plastic, this little tray inside here to actually hold it. Cause normally the mini map box from Small Rig holds the four by 5.65 ND filters, which just they're bigger and they're more expensive. So I actually don't own any of them. All the ones I own are the four by four ND filters, which are a little more common. Hopefully in the future, Small Rig adds a little adapter like this. So you can easily put four by four filters in the mini map box because I like it better. Now, something very cool about this mini map box that's worth talking about is there's threading actually inside of it. So if you have a variable ND filter that's circular, you can actually just screw it right onto the front here and you can continue using your variable ND filter. So you don't actually have to buy any new NDs. Um, so if you have like the Tiffin one that's pretty cheap, it's only 120 bucks, or maybe you have the one from uh, Polar Pro, the Peter McKinnon, you can throw them right here on the front and then use your variable ND filter. Those are so easy to use, they're fast, and you get the benefits of a map box. So I definitely recommend it. I have this map box linked down below in the description of this video, so if you're wondering which one I'm talking about, just check down there. So that's one of my favorite benefits of using one of these. The next thing I will say that you must add to any camera, and I really think it's a huge benefit, is a monitor. So up here I have the small HD focus. And you know what guys, I think, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they discontinued this, which is crazy because it was like the most popular one they've ever made. But if you go to small HD's website and look for the focus five, I can't find it anymore. And I can't find it on uh, B&H or Adorama. I don't know what happened, but I think they're focusing on some of their larger, nicer ones now. Um, but this one was great. You could get it for like $400. You might be able to find it used on eBay. So that's what I'm using up top here. And the biggest benefit, and this is probably obvious, but to having an external monitor and not focusing just on this little tiny LCD, um, and, and this is an average size. I think this is about two and a half inches on the Canon M50. It's about the same on almost all of these cameras, except for like the pocket 4K, 6K, they all have the larger five inch screen. Anyways, it's so nice to have a top monitor and I like, I will never shoot without one. If I have to rely on this, I don't know if I have good focus. I, I can't rely on it for focus. So does your footage and your image look better by rigging out your camera? Honestly, the answer is probably yes, because you can actually pull great focus and you can also get get better exposure. Sometimes it's really hard to tell how things are exposed on a small monitor. When you get it on a larger five inch or seven inch, um, it's much easier to see your exposure and you have way more tools built in. So something um, that's great about this small HD focus is you have your waveforms, your false color and your zebras, and of course many other things like histogram. Um, but all those tools make it so easy to get really great exposure. So your footage is going to look a lot better and much sharper because you can pull focus on this bigger screen. So those are honestly two things that I think really improve your video work. 
and make it worth rigging out your camera as opposed to just going light and small and not rigging it out. So let's take a look at the chat, see what you guys are talking about. I want to kind of stay on topic, but also, you know, see what you guys are thinking and answer any of your questions. All right. So Glenn Reed is saying, which HDMI cable are you using? Yeah. So for this one, I'm just using the small HD HDMI cable. It actually comes with the monitor when you buy one, but I've bought like four of these small HD cables because they're so light and thin. Um, it makes it really, really easy to use them on a gimbal and they don't get like large and cumbersome. And this one's only like, I think it's 12 inches long. So it's not very long, but it's just enough so that you don't have all that extra cable wrapping around your rig. It's just enough to go from the side of the camera and into your monitor. So I always prefer the smallest HDMI cable I can get away with. I don't use anything longer, honestly, than 18 inches, nothing. I don't, even on a gimbal, 18 inches is enough to get from up on top of the camera down to a monitor that I usually have mounted on my gimbal. So highly recommend. They're a little bit more expensive, the small HD ones, but man, they're high quality. They handle 4K image fine. They handle uh, 4K ProRes RAW with no problem. They handle B RAW with no problem in 6K. So great transfer rates and they're really solid cables. So highly recommend. Um, Let's see, Carlos Romero says, do you think the kind of films or videos you make will decide if you should rig your camera? Yeah, that's definitely a large factor. Here's, here's one thing I'll say. Anytime I've ever seen someone shooting a documentary, when I've gone out and shoot small docs, or you know, shooting anything that's commercial work, that's professional and gonna be paid for by a client, everyone rigs out their camera. I, I don't see people very often show up with a light, small body, just completely naked because it honestly kind of looks embarrassing. I will say, and I mean, it's okay. It's not all about the looks, but there's a lot of utilitarian, like there's a lot of stuff that comes along with this that's helpful, I guess you could say. It's utilitarian, it's not just for looks. So I will say one of my first videos I've ever done, I've actually done a video about this on the channel, we're viewing like the first video I ever made for a client, a business client. And I showed up to film a video for him, it was an insurance company, we were just doing an ad for him. And I showed up with the Canon Rebel T3i, that was my first ever DSLR camera that I purchased and I bet a lot of you guys started on something similar like the T2i, T3i. It's a very popular one to start on. Anyways, I showed up with that camera, nothing on it, no rigging. I hadn't started out with anything. I just had a lens and that and like a microphone and a few lights. And he was like, hey, I have that camera. Yeah, it's a, that's a nice little camera. He's like, oh, that's cool. And it was just like, mm, yeah. And he's paying me to do this. Uh, you know, it's just a little bit embarrassing for him to be like, yeah, I'm paying you like decent money. It was my first video, so it wasn't a ton. Um, I think honestly, the, that was the first video I ever charged for and it was about five or 600 bucks. So it wasn't a lot, but it was a good place to start. And it was just a little bit funny, him being like, oh yeah, yeah, I have that camera. It's, it's, it's a nice little camera. And it's like, oh, okay. But if I had it fully rigged out and built out, honestly, you probably wouldn't even notice what camera it was and it would have had some nice useful features. So there is something to be said about that and the type of work you're doing. Um, let's see. Hamani Ahmed, what's up? He says, can I learn live montage? I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Tell me what you mean by that live montage. All right, um, fellow creator says, we can find Focus 5 in India. Oh, okay, that's cool. So it's still available in some places. In America, I can't find the, the small HD Focus 5 anymore. Like I literally tried finding one because I was trying to see if I could buy one. Not available anymore here that I can find. Let's see. Um, I'm gonna mess this up again, but Hide says, says monitor definitely helps, especially if you get an Atomos external recorder, also helps reduce you looking down using your neck and causing neck pain. Yeah, totally true, um, definitely. So obviously with the small HD and other external monitors like the Feel World, Newer, Lily Putts, there's a bunch of just normal external monitors and I use them regularly but that's all they do, right? They monitor. With Atomos, you're getting a monitor and recorder, meaning that actually none of the recording happens internally in the camera. It all happens on the Atomos. I have mine sitting back there and it allows you to shoot in ProRes. So if you edit in 
uh, Final Cut Pro especially, ProRes is incredible. I mean, it, it plays back immediately. You drop it into a timeline, it plays back beautifully immediately, even in ProRes RAW. It's incredible. And obviously with the new Apple M1 chips coming out, it's getting better. The Pro and the, the M1 Pro and the M1 Max, I'm sure you guys have seen a bunch of videos on them, has a section of the chip built just for ProRes rendering, which is incredible. So it is such a good time to be shooting ProRes because, oh man, it's just beautiful to edit. So the Atomos recorder obviously makes it really simple and easy to record in ProRes, which I can do with the Canon M50 in full ProRes 4K um, 422, which is really nice to be able to do that and get that codec out of this camera. So it definitely can improve your footage, you know, rigging out with something like that. All right. Um, Hamani says, this camera is for artistic or cinematic photography. Okay, yeah, so I mean, obviously a camera you know, I think if you do photography and that's the kind of thing that you do, you're probably not going to rig out your camera really at all. Like all of this stuff would just get in the way, be heavy, annoying, and you just can't, yeah, you just wouldn't want to use this for photography. The only thing I would say, depending on the type of photography you're doing, you might want to use an ND filter. And for that, I'd probably just use a screw on variable ND filter. And that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, for photography, something like this is overkill. Do I take photos with my camera rigged out? Yeah, sometimes I definitely do. Like when I'm out shooting videos um, and I need to snap a couple stills, boom, boom, boom. Hit a couple stills, not a problem, but I wouldn't ever do photography with it rigged out. That would be pretty hilarious. Um, all right, let's see what else is going on. Um, schedule admin, great info as always. Thank you. Thank you for joining. It's always good to see you. Uh, Timothy, uh, your thought on the Panasonic GH6. I have not seen much about this. I mean, this is this is news to me, honestly. I know they had the Panasonic GH5 and GH5S forever, but GH6, I think I might have missed that announcement. Let me see. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about that camera. Um, I know they did the S1H and the S5, but the GH6? Hmm, haven't seen it yet. Let me see. I'm looking right now, okay. When did this get announced? I'm seeing on their website right now the announcement for it and it's just kind of like in shade. It's like this dark image of it. So that's exciting that's coming. I haven't heard about that yet. I'll definitely have to check it out. Obviously Panasonic makes really great cameras. Um, my thing is I'm not a huge fan of Micro Four Thirds, and I'm assuming it's also going to be a Micro Four Thirds camera, just like the GH5 uh, and the GH4. The reason that I'm not a G, uh, like a big fan of Micro Four Thirds is because it's not as good in low light, and it doesn't get as good of shallow depth of field as easily. You have to get a very wide open lens, like f1.8 at least, to get that nice shallow depth of field that you can get a lot easier out of an APS-C camera or, of course, full frame. Right now I'm shooting on the Sony FX3, and it's just so much easier to get that shallow depth of field with full frame. So that's because of my shooting style, it's not what I would reach for typically, but usually Micro Four Thirds cameras are a lot cheaper, especially like the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, really cheap camera. I mean, relatively cheap camera, like $1,200, $1,300, but just a beautiful image and it's Micro Four Thirds. So yeah, I'll have to look more into that. That's exciting that they're finally coming out with one. Um, Thanks for bringing that up, Timothy. I'm going to do some research on it now. Let's see. Uh, Shay says, interested in doing photography as well as music videos, etc. but I live in the Caribbean. That sounds nice. And it's hard to get equipment. Was looking at the Sony A7S III. Any suggestions have no knowledge in the field? Yeah, so obviously the A7S III is pretty much the top of the line when it comes to small mirrorless cameras that are hybrid for photo and video. It's probably one of the best ones um, that you can get. Uh, but it's obviously very expensive, and I know things are more expensive outside of the United States. Even in Canada, it's more expensive for some of these cameras. Like, they're just marked up even higher without the exchange rate. So for you, honestly, if you're having trouble finding these things, look on eBay, see what you can get shipped to you internationally, and I might get something like the Sony a7 III or the a7S II, and it's going to be a lot cheaper, easier to come by, and... Still really great cameras. You're getting full frame, great low light performance, great 4K, in-body image stabilization, 
um, you know, all of that stuff that you want. Um, and it's going to great work great for photo and music videos. And you're in the Caribbean, which is obviously gorgeous. So pretty much any way you point that camera, it's gonna look beautiful, I feel like. So yeah, I would look into something used, honestly, especially if you're saying you're interested in doing photography and music videos and you haven't done it before, don't spend all of your money upfront on the camera because you still have to buy lenses, which get expensive. You want a lot of different lenses if possible or multiple options and you need lights. Um, you know, equipment to edit on that sort of thing. So I wouldn't invest all your money in the camera up front. And that's just like my advice across the board. If you're just getting into this, make sure you're spreading out your budget and not dropping it all on the camera body. Cause there's a lot of things that are just as important or more important than the camera body. All right. I see still more questions popping in and I want to talk about them. Um, Sarah area says is focus polling really works with normal lenses, is it a mess? Yeah, so on here I have the new small rig mini follow focus and I really love this thing. So right now I have it hooked up on my Rokinon Cine DS lens. This is the 50 millimeter and it has gears built into it for both the aperture and your focus. So obviously with the teeth on there, they're that standard teeth that you know, pretty much work with any follow focus. It's really easy to pull focus smoothly and, you know, kind of nail your focus without getting a lot of extra jitters and shakes that you might get by putting your hand on the lens. Um, but what I will say is when you're using photo lenses, it's a little bit more difficult to work with pulling focus with one of these. Yes, you can use those gears. A lot of people do it. They throw a little rubber gear you know, those little rubber gears that tighten down around the outside of your photo lenses that don't have gears. People do it all the time. Just try and get a good quality one. There's some nice ones that are form fitting just that lens size. So if you know the diameter of your lens, you can get one that pretty much stretches around and then just clamps down onto it. And it works a lot better than the ones that kind of have like a tail, like you tighten it down and then there's like that little floppy part. It's like sticking out the side. That's annoying. And obviously like that little floppy part hits as you pull focus. So try to get one that is perfectly form fitting for your lens. It's just a single ring and it'll slide on and then you won't have that extra tail because it's adjustable. And if you have a lot of photo still steals lens, just get a bunch of the rings, one that fits each lens, keep them on there permanently. And those will work a lot better. And yes, you could pull focus with them. I pulled focus with those gear rings on my photo stills lenses many times, especially before I started investing in more like cinema style lenses like this that had the gears. That's what I was doing and it worked fine. It wasn't my favorite. As soon as I switched to all cine style lenses, it was a lot better. But let's talk about this little small rig mini fo follow focus. So on this channel, I've shown follow focuses a lot. Mostly for the past two years, I've been talking about the Tilta Nucleus Nano. It's wireless. It's really my favorite, you know, a wireless follow focus. But when you're doing just handheld work like this, you don't really need wireless. You can simply pull it here yourself. You don't have to worry about batteries, you know, wireless connections failing, which sometimes happens with the Tilta Nucleus Nano. If you have the focus wheel too close to the motor, um, it will not communicate properly. They need a little bit of distance from each other. If they're too close, it's a kind of weird interference. So you need them separate from each other. So I've been talking a ton about that, but recently um, I just did a little review of this small rig mini follow focus. It's really cheap. I think you can get it for 90 to $100 on Amazon and it's solid. It's actually the best little small one like this that I've used. I've used other ones from Fotga. I've made reviews of that, but this one's super adjustable. There's all these different little knobs on it so you can get it exactly where you want. And you can, of course, swap this little gear here to the other side if you need to. So you can pull focus on the left hand side of your rig or the right hand side of your rig, depending on how you want to do it. But for me, adding a follow focus like this definitely helps improve my camera and my footage because it just gets a lot smoother for pulling focus. And there's these little hard stops. You guys are probably familiar with these if you have a follow focus. But basically, let's say you focus on a character and you set that little hard stop. And then let's say you're trying to pull focus to another character. You set, you tighten it down. And then there's this little knob right here that'll hit at each spot. And so you know you're getting a perfect focus from subject A or point A to point B every time with these little hard stops. So 
that's really nice to have and will improve your footage, especially if you're trying to do some rack focusing between subjects. So does rigging out your camera make your footage better? Does it make your camera better? Yes, this is one of the ways that it does. And so, you know, I wish everyone that comments on the videos could see, you know, hopefully watch this video because they say, you know, this didn't make it any better. There are ways that it makes it better and that's another way that really can improve your footage. So. Let's take a look at the comments. I'm trying to, you know, stay on topic with that, but also see what awesome things you guys are talking about. Uh, it's just really fun to hop on, do these live streams. It's been, I think, at least a month or two since I've done one. So it's fun to hang out with you guys. Thank you all for joining. If you're enjoying this, by the way, make sure you hit like right now. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel. If you're not subscribed, that would be weird if you're here. Like, but if this is your first time here or something, thank you. <laughs> make sure you're subscribed. All right. Um, Carlos Romero says, have you tried mobile app monitor uh, plus and do you think it replaces an actual monitor? So I'm not sure that I've tried that exact one, this mobile app monitor plus, but yes, I have used my phone. Where is my phone? I've used my phone many times just for external monitor. It's not my favorite way and I don't think that it replaces a professional monitor, but if you don't have the money for an external monitor yet, yes, I mean, do it. It's obviously a bigger screen and these the, the screens on our phones have gotten so much better a lot of them are hdr especially if you're using an iphone so it has a ton of brightness and they have really good color science to them so you're going to see a pretty accurate image my biggest issue with using a smartphone as an external monitor is that there's a lot of latency typically basically meaning you know there could be a one second delay or two second delay hopefully not that much so it kind of makes it hard when you're trying to frame something up and see your image and monitor it when it's like slightly behind actual real time whereas when you have it plugged in directly with an hdmi cable the latency is negligible it's like pretty much nothing <laughs> it's like instant whereas when you're using something wireless obviously you're going to have a little bit of that latency but again if you already have a smartphone Definitely you can do that. And there's cool tools built into it. I know you can change your focus or your aperture, your ISO a lot of times with the mobile apps, especially depending on your camera. I know Sony, Canon, a couple of the other cameras, Blackmagic has some cool apps that will allow you to control the camera from the monitor, you know, from the app on your phone itself. So those are some pretty cool features that you don't get with most monitors. I know the port keys monitors have some control to them that allow you to control the camera itself, especially on Blackmagic and on the Red Komodo and a couple of the other cameras out there. The Z cams will all allow you to con control the camera itself with the port keys monitor. So some good options there, but yes, I think using your phone is a fine option, but when you have the money, invest in an external monitor that has all the really good tools built into it, like false color, zebras, waveforms, and you can find them for about a hundred bucks on Amazon. Honestly, they're, they've gotten so cheap and they're pretty decent. So yeah, I would definitely just invest in one of those when you can. And that way you can use your phone for other, for other stuff on set. And of course you're going to look more professional using that. All right. Um, yeah, Greg Jones says, unfortunately, some clients will judge you by your gear. Yeah, that's definitely the case. Um, like I mentioned earlier, one client, you know, if you're just joining live stream said, oh, I have that camera and it was the Canon Rebel T3i and he's like, that's, that's a nice little camera. And it was just like, ooh, yeah, this is not super professional. So I will say that is a, a bit of a thing you want to have you know, professional equipment on set. They're going to trust you more. They're going to hire you more often when you show up and look like a true professional. It's not everything, but it definitely, you know, that client relationship matters. So let's see here. Um, interview media production. What's up? It says, I've rigged out my 90D with Sigma 18 to 35 with the top handle, mini side handle, motor and focus pole for a martial arts client. Love the atmosphere and ease of use it's done for me. That's awesome. It sounds like a really good rig. Sounds very similar to what, you know, I would rock here, you know, with a focus polar top handle. The Sigma 18 to 35 is obviously like a go-to lens. Everyone loves that lens. So that's awesome. It sounds like a great rig. And I bet your client was, you know, happy to see with good professional looking equipment. The nice thing about that is you said it was a martial arts client. So when you have a handheld rig, it's probably easy to get close in, do a lot of those movements and stuff with a handle or a side handle and kind of get um, some more interesting angles and a bit of that, add a bit of that energy that comes with handheld work. Now, here's the thing. I would not feel comfortable doing handheld work 
with the camera body only and just the lens. I know st some people do this. I see them do it and it's impressive. I just, I don't feel that way. I need that extra heft, that extra weight to stabilize the sensor. Even if you have a stabilized sensor, having that extra weight just helps so much. So I like, I really like having a side handle. This is just a simple wooden one from small, um, from small rig that has a natal rail clamp on it. And obviously this gives you another place to grip so you can pull focus or from the top, depending on how you're shooting. But I love being able to do that. And I think handheld work looks so much better when it's in a rig as opposed to when you're doing it just like just the body only. I find my handheld work, at least personally, ends up like with micro jitters and it's not good. <laughs> it's not the best. So, yeah, that's awesome. I think it's great to rig it out. All right. Um, Louis Palomino says, how about slow motion with Atomos? Yes, you could definitely do slow motion with the Atomos. Right now, most of the cameras that are doing it output is 60 frames per second. That's the highest slow motion. But I do believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there is one camera, and I'm kind of blanking on which one it is. It might be the Canon R5. Uh, which one is it? is it? One of them does 120. Um, so obviously even slower with the Atomos Ninja V. So just depends on the camera, but most of them do at least 60 frames per second slow motion, and it looks great. I film in that all the time. All right. Um, Jordan Kelly says, I got my camera and bought the Cajun stuff to fully rig it out, but a lot of the time I usually just take the camera when I go out. I don't make any sort of production videos. Yeah, so obviously there are times when you just want to go out really quick. You don't want to you know, fuss with all the gear, putting it together, and you want to stay lightweight. I think that's fine. Um, obviously, it just depends on what you're shooting. If you're not doing a lot of production videos and it's more like personal stuff or like family videos or just vlogs, whatever it is, you're going to want to go a lot lighter and smaller. Obviously, you wouldn't catch me, you know, dead vlogging with this thing. It's obviously way too heavy and just just uncomfortable to vlog with. So, no, if I was vlogging with this camera, which I would if I was a vlogger, I'm not into that, but um, obviously the little flip out LCD um, is going to make this camera so light, simple to see myself and just throw a microphone on. And that would be it. So there are definitely situations where rigging it out is not the right choice. I find that I'm kind of a mixed bag. Usually when I travel, I still try to rig it out. Like if I'm flying into another state and I'm on vacation or I'm just trying to get some cool footage, I still bring a lot of equipment, to be honest. Um, I'll still have a cage, top handle, monitor, maybe a follow focus. A lot of times I'll just pull, pull focus manual off the lens to save a little bit of room. Um, and sometimes the side handle, but I always have a top handle and a monitor and usually, honestly, a map box with a VMD in it. So that's usually how I'll travel and I'll, I'll build it out when I get there and I'll just, you know, I'll walk around town with this huge camera rig, um, honestly, sometimes bigger than this and just walk around town shooting stuff. Sometimes I'm going in and out of stores and whatever and people are, I don't know, they'll just look at me like, what is this? What are you doing? Are you filming like a little doc or what is this? But it doesn't matter. It helps me get better footage. Um, but I know for some people they want to travel like ultralight, so they won't rig it out at all. It's totally up to you. For me, it helps me get better footage, better stabilized footage, better quality footage, but you can definitely go without rigging it out depending on what you're shooting. So yeah, no issue with that. Just depends on what you want to do. So, all right. Chris Polk says, I'm late to the party. Tilt to lens gears are cheap as chips and have much more size range than small rig. Uh, monitor plus is monitor plus is dope on Sony with pixel six ZVE 10 over USB-C is very low latency. Okay. Interesting. I'm gonna have to check this out. I haven't, I haven't used the monitor plus, but you know, a couple of you guys are talking about the monitor plus. I'm going to have to look it up and see how it works, especially if you are plugging it in USB-C directly into your phone, then your latency issue is pretty much gone. I didn't know it was that way. I thought it was wireless. That's how I've done it with the phone in the past is usually I just have the phone and I link up with the app to the camera and obviously you're going to have latency. So that's really cool that you can plug it right in. I'm going to check that out. Monitor Plus, something to check out. And yeah, like Chris Polk said, Tilta does have nice little gear rings that you can buy. You just got to figure out the diameter of your lens and then they're going to tightly fit around it nice and snug. Definitely worth checking those out. Um, yeah, Brian Sen is, uh, is adding to that saying you can plug the phone in, but you need an adapter to change from HDMI to USB-C. Okay, yeah, I'll have to check that out. I know a lot of cameras have the USB-C out on them now, so as long as 
it supports that. Maybe you can just go USB-C to USB-C. I'm not sure. I'm going to check that out, though. That's that's pretty cool. Let's see. Um, Chris Polk adding to that saying for the iPhone, you need 5G Wi-Fi. Sony APS-C is stuck to 2.4. Okay, interesting. Yeah, I, I'm going to have to look more into this. this. It sounds kind of interesting. Again, I don't use my mobile phone very often for this kind of stuff, but it's cool that that's a possibility, so I'll have to check it out. Um, Donovan Brown saying, on the topic of using your phone, can you use a capture card and connect the camera via HDMI? Hmm. I've never done that before. If you guys know of any way to do that, like actually capture your footage in the phone itself, using it as the basically the memory um, for your footage, let me know. Comment below, let them know. I don't I haven't seen that. What I can say is obviously the new iPhone. What are we on now? Like iPhone 12, iPhone 13. Oh my gosh, it's the iPhone 13. So it just goes so fast every year. iPhone 13 obviously has ProRes on it, which is incredible. And if you use the app Filmic Pro, you're getting even more control over the camera itself. So I bet you can get some really beautiful footage with that. And if you get the one terabyte version of the iPhone 13, then obviously that's incredible. You're gonna have great footage and it's all recorded internally on a one terabyte drive. I mean, eventually when I upgrade, I might do that. Right now I don't need to, but in the future having ProRes and a one terabyte phone would be incredible because I do get a lot of my behind the scenes footage with my phone. And sometimes I'll even snap thumbnails with my phone. Um, it's just so convenient to have with you. And so getting a better camera and that sort of option is awesome. Um, let's see. Chris Polk is saying, can we get a campaign going for an updated Sigma 18 to 35? Yeah, obviously that's been like a cult classic lens. It's one of the most popular lenses out there for Blackmagic users, Sony users, Canon users. Everyone loves that lens. And yeah, it'd be cool to see them update it to a Cine style instead of their, obviously Sigma has the Sigma Cine zooms, but they're way expensive. I think they're about uh, $4,000 a piece roughly, which for me, for a lens, Right now is just too expensive. That's too much. So obviously it'd be really cool to have them do like a Sigma 18 to 35 Cine zoom. That's kind of like the quality of a Rokinon or a Mikey lens where it's decent, but it's not going to be ultra expensive. So that'd be very cool to have them do that. Yeah. Brian Barajas says a lighter Sigma 18 to 35 with image stabilization. Yeah, that would be awesome. And par focal, <laughs> says Chris Polk. Yeah, zero. See, this is where it gets expensive though. Once you start adding like parfocal, zero focus breathing, silent autofocus, all those things really add up. So I think it's possible, but it's gonna get expensive to do. So there's kind of that balance, right? Because I think the Sigma 18 to 35 is about 800 bucks, I believe. So it's, it's not a really cheap lens, but it's still affordable and it's not a very expensive lens. It's just kind of a good mid-range lens. And obviously that um, F1.8 is beautiful, so. Yeah, if they could update it, but keep it in the affordable range, but add some gears to it, I think that'd be really great because I see so many people use it on their rigs. I personally haven't bought one. I don't own the Sigma 18 to 35. Let me know, should I buy it? I know everyone uses it, um, but I just haven't invested in it. The lens I'm using right now on the Sony FX3 is the 16 to 35. So it's actually a little bit wider. And it's a nice lens. It's the G Master F2.8. So it doesn't open up as wide at F1.8. But the 18 to 35 is for APS-C only, so I can't even use it on a full frame um, camera. So my kind of compromise there is the G Master 16 to 35, which I love, and it gives me great, you know, focal range here. So, all right, um, I want to talk about a couple more things about rigging out the camera. Make sure I'm kind of hitting on all the different parts here. So we talked about ND filters. We talked about the follow focus map boxes. We talked about the Atomos Ninja V or other external reco recorders giving you pro res. Um, let's talk about rigging it out with an external battery. So on the Canon M50, which I have rigged out here and I just did a full video on, I didn't add a V-mount battery to it because I didn't actually own a dummy battery for this. On this camera, you have to have a dummy battery. You can't plug in like USB-C or anything to power the camera you got to buy their dummy battery and then I can plug it into a V-mount battery. Now, pretty much any time I go out shooting with the Sony FX3, the Blackmagic cameras, Sony A6600, anything like that, I am using a dummy battery or plugging in the side with USB-C like on the Fujifilm X-T4 
and using a V-mount battery because you do not want to worry about battery life when you're out on a shoot. There's nothing worse than being out shooting and being like, crap, I got to switch batteries. I'm going to miss this shot, especially if it's something that's live, like you're doing documentary style, a wedding, an event, a live stream, anything like that. The last thing you want to worry about is battery life. So anytime I rig out my camera, I usually throw a V-mount battery around the back. I just didn't do it on this rig because I don't have that dummy battery. But in any other rig build, I always add one because these cameras with a good size V-mount battery, like um, like a 100, 100 watt V-mount battery will last you pretty much all day long. Um, obviously it depends on how many accessories you have plugged into it. It's great to power everything off of one V-mount, like your monitor, if you're using a wireless follow focus, wireless transmitter, anything like that. It's so nice to be able to plug everything into it, but I just wasn't able to do that on this rig. So normally I would though. Thanks for hanging in here with me, guys. Sorry, I got to get a little drink every once in a while with all this nonstop talking. Um, if you guys are enjoying this so far, if you're enjoying hanging out with me, please make sure you hit like and make sure you're subscribed to the channel. YouTube kind of, I swear, I know the algorithm hates a lot of people, but sometimes I feel like they hate me because I post videos and you guys don't always see them. Um, so if you haven't been seeing some of my recent videos, go check out the channel. I post pretty much every single week. So there's always videos on there. Make sure you're subscribed. Really appreciate it. All right, so continue, continuing on, we've talked about you know having that all day battery life from a V-mount now. Uh, we talked about stabilizing the camera a little bit better with different top handles, side handles, that sort of thing. Um, focusing better with a monitor. Let's see, pulling better focus with the follow focus. Um, let's talk about external recorders. Um, besides the Atomos Ninja V, um, using an SSD on something like the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, the 6K, 6K Pro, um, the Z cams, a lot of them allow you to use something like the Samsung T5 SSD. And this is the one terabyte version. So obviously it allows you to record a long time, like hours and hours of footage on it. And that can really help improve and make your camera better because most SD cards aren't that big. Obviously you can get the one terabyte ones. Those are expensive and I just don't trust one terabyte of footage on a small SSD, um, excuse me, on a small SD card. So yes, adding something like an external um, SSD can improve your experience with your camera as long as it's reliable and all the footage goes here and you can edit off of it. They're super fast. Same thing goes for this. This is the Sony 500 gigabyte SSD that fits inside of the Atomos Ninja V or any other Atomos recorder. These are just so reliable. They're so fast. They're easy to edit off of. So anytime I can record externally, I do. So usually I'm using the Ninja V or on the Blackmagic, I'm using one of these SSDs. And I think most people, I feel like most people are doing that. They're a lot cheaper than CFast or like the higher end SD cards that a lot of people are using now. Um, these are just a lot cheaper route to go and give you more storage. So yeah, I think this kind of stuff can improve your camera. Uh, you know, prove me wrong <laughs> is, is, is having the ability to do that an improvement on your camera or is it unnecessary? Should you just record internally? You guys let me know. And actually, you know what? I will say some things you have to re record externally to get the highest bit rate, to get the highest possible um, quality out of your camera. For instance, on the, um, a, uh, excuse me, the FX3, too many camera names, on the Sony FX3 that I'm using right now, the only way to get ProRes RAW is with an external recorder, the Atomos Ninja V. I don't know of any camera right now that records ProRes RAW internally. So you've got to do something like this to get that ProRes RAW capability. And a lot of them, they just, they have better throughput when you're using something externally than internally, you get the best codecs. So yes, it can improve your footage. All right, let's see here. Um, trying to see what else is going on down in the comments. All right. Uh, Brian Baraja says Sigma can do it. Tokina Cine $2,300. Yeah, so I have the Tokina Cinema zoom lens that is the 11 to 20 millimeters. Um, obviously a little bit different focal range than the 18 to 35 but it's not a bad price. $2,300 is obviously more on the expensive expensive end of lenses 
definitely is for me. It was an investment, something that I'm gonna keep for a really long time. Sometimes I even rent it out because it's a nice little um, cine lens. But yeah, if Sigma could do that, that'd be awesome. Um, uh, let's see. Tony Fuego says, I love it, but man, it's heavy and I eat tons of broccoli. So I think he's talking about rigging out his camera and then it gets really heavy. So, you know, gotta stay up and work out to be able to lug it around all day. Uh, let's see. Jordan Kelly saying, I'm, I'm a big fan of all your videos. It inspired my rig. Thanks, dude. I appreciate that. I really hope you guys get something out of it and make your own custom rigs that you love. So he says, I have a camcorder with a cage, monitor, side handle, and external power for special events. My mirrorless is more for photos, but it's rigged out too. That's cool. Yeah, I, I don't see a ton of people rig out the camcorder, but every once in a while I'll do. So that's really cool that you've got it rigged out, working really well for you. What I will say that I love about the camcorder, obviously it's kind of less popular now. It really is. It has everything built into it. Like right there is a flip out screen. You have usually inputs for XLRs. Some, t some of them have ND filters built into them. So there's actually a lot of cool things for it. I know like a lot of, um, documentaries and stuff are shot still on DNG camcorders, usually a little bit bigger ones. I don't know what size yours is, but so that's really cool. And it's cool. You got your uh, photo camera rigged out as well. So appreciate that, man. Um, Tony Fuego saying just logged on M50. Um, I think I'm going to buy one. Yeah, dude, that's, that's what I've got here. Fully rigged out. You can see it looks like a really great camera just rigged out like this it becomes so much more functional and it's cheap. Like I said, I got this for less than $400 used on eBay. You get full 4K autofocus, great color signs from Canon. So not a bad, not a bad camera still to buy. All right, let's see. Uh, Chris Polk says, for transporting, I like NATO rails and Arca Swiss, so I can break it down quick. One rod up top for follow focus and gaff tape, cine foil instead of matte box because I'm a hobbyist. Yeah, dude, I think that's great. I love NATO rail. That's what I have on top here. This top handle is fully NATO rail. Honestly, when I first started out, I was a little bit weary of NATO rail. I heard a lot of people say that the connection wasn't solid and that it would like move, but that is not true. As long as you get a good NATO rail top handle, not true. And it's it's pretty quick to take it off. You don't need any tools. You don't need, you know, obviously any Allen keys or anything. So NATO rail quick to take off. And then, yeah, sounds like you rock a similar rig. I've got the one 15 millimeter rod off the top here with the follow focus hanging from the top. So I actually been really a big fan of that. I used to put two 15 millimeter rods on the bottom of my camera every single time. And I actually haven't done that for a year or two, I've been doing everything from a single 15 millimeter rod typically because usually my follow focus is the only thing on a 15 millimeter rod because the matte box itself clamps to the front and I'll show you that. So this just clamps right onto the front, tightens down so you don't need 15 millimeter rods. So you actually save a lot of space and weight by just using a clamp on matte box. So I absolutely love that. And I love having the follow focus just on one rod. Um, and not needing them, you know, two. So yeah, I love that. Sounds like your rig is pretty similar to the ones that I've been rocking. Um, and yeah, using a, you know, gaff tape and cine foil for your matte box is interesting. I've done that before when I, when I've forgotten a lens hood, I'll just wrap um, some cine foil and just like that gaff tape it around the outside of the lens. So it creates a really long lens hood. So you don't get any um, <laughs> unwanted lens flares or anything. So yeah, I definitely, definitely can relate to that, man. Very cool. Um, let's see, Tony Fuego saying, yeah, he hasn't been seeing my videos. Yeah, dude, go back to the back catalog. I've posted a ton every single week. Go check them out. Um, yeah, for whatever reason, YouTube is not, you know, putting them up in everyone's feeds. So go check it out. I'm always posting. Um, let's see, Chris Polk, can the M50 film raw? No, it cannot. Um, it doesn't have any sort of like Canon C log or C log you know, raw lights or anything like that. You can't do Canon, or excuse me, you can't do ProRes raw. It doesn't output anything like that. Um, you're just gonna get 4K 30 frames per second is the best it can do. So yeah, that's it, it's a it's an entry level camera. So you're definitely not gonna get some of those higher end features out of it. But if you need another camera, possibly a second angle or something, I don't think it's a bad choice. Honestly, it's not bad. All right. Um, Oh, okay, Brian Barajas, maybe I stand corrected. He says, yes, it can with the Magic Lantern. I need to dive into that. A lot of people have been talking about Magic Lantern. And on my first camera, the Canon Rebel T3i, I was considering 
getting Magic Lantern, but I was scared of like bricking the camera, just ruining it by installing um, Magic Lantern because I've heard crazy nightmares like that before. But I'm going to have to check it out with this camera and see what I can do. Um, let's see, Jordan Kel Kelly saying, my camcorder came with a USB charge cable. I have two 10,000 milliamp power banks on a small rig cheese plate. It's, it's <clears throat> nice because I can still use the battery if I have to switch banks without losing power. Yeah, that's awesome. So sounds like you have a ton of battery life for your camcorder with that. That's very cool. All right. Um, and I do that too. I do, I'll use a small like um, external power bank depending on the camera. Some of them work great with external power banks. And so I'll grab one of those instead of a V-mount battery. So yeah, definitely a good option. All right. Um, Chris Polk saying, M50 was also in my price range. Lens selection turned me off. Adapting EF is an option, but smaller lenses on APS-C can be advantage sometimes. Yeah, so obviously the lens mount on this is, it's the EOS M mount. And I don't know if you can see this, but I have an adapter on there. This is a Canon EF mount lens. I don't own any EOS M mount lenses. If I wanted really good autofocus, then obviously, I would probably get a native EOS M lens, but I didn't want to invest in that lineup of lenses. Pretty much everything I buy is Canon EF. I've like talked about this so much on the channel. I've tried to drill it in everyone's heads. I think Canon EF is the best lens mount out there. And here's why. It is adaptable to any camera body out there. Canon EF works on Sony, Panasonic, Obviously, their uh, EOS M mount, um, the R5, like, excuse me, like the Canon R mount, EOS R. Canon EF works on everything. And that's because of the flange distance. I don't want to get nerdy scientific, but basically where the lens lands, it has to be further away from the sensor because it's used to having that um, mirrorless, basically having the mirror in there and having a little bit more space. But now that that's all gone because it's mirrorless, there's this big gap. And you can fill that with an adapter. So... Canon EF, baby. Woo! It's my favorite. It's the way to go. I'm telling you. It's the future. Unless you need really good autofocus, then uh, probably get a native lens to whatever camera body it is because um, your autofocus is going to be okay. But for me, I'm almost always manually focusing um, and that's just the way that I rock. So I don't care if it's Canon EF. I don't care if it's dead. All my lenses are manual for the most part, except for when I'm doing this kind of talking head stuff. Have to have autofocus because I can't pull focus on myself. So anyways, the Canon EF mount over. All right, let's see. Um, okay, uh, Jordan Kelly, I'm trying to keep up with your comments. I appreciate everything you guys are talking about here. Jordan Kelly saying, I used to film a lot of skateboarding, so having a camera I could film all day was key. I have a wide angle lens and fisheye plus insane zoom. Yeah, a camcorder, man, that's like the go-to for skaters, dude. I swear, because that has that top handle. You can ride with it really easy. Um, back in the day, I saw a ton of guys using that. I don't I don't skate much anymore. I mostly longboard. I don't know. Let me, guys, let, let me know in the comments, guys. Do you longboard? Do you skate? I'd love to know if you guys do that still. Uh, I'm scared of like falling and breaking my wrist or arm with skateboarding. But longboarding is a lot safer. So... Uh, Brian Barajas says, I'm happy with Magic Lantern and a $180 Canon M1, Sigma 18-35, to Tokina 11-20, to and more built around that setup. Yeah, man, it sounds like you have a good selection of lenses there. Um, it's always good to invest in great glass that you can bring with you to every camera body. Uh, Colton Photographer says, always appreciate your rig videos. As someone who loves rigs, um, while I'm definitely getting big with my rigs, be it Red, Aerie, Sony, or Panasonic, new parts are always an inspiration. Yeah, man, I appreciate that. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope I hope that the camera rigs help you guys. I do a ton of them on this channel. It's just fun to talk about and build them out and work with them. I work with cameras every single day for work, and I almost always have them rigged out. So that's really cool, man. It sounds like you've got some great rigs that you're building on all different cameras. So very cool. All right. Um, yeah, Colin, Colin also saying, plus my personal rigs are very rigged out, the GH5 ENG setup and a cine rigged BGH1. That's cool. Let me know, how do you like the BGH1? I haven't tried one yet, but it looks interesting. It looks like a really cool camera. So great features on it. Um, let's see, Ruben, I have a little pro says, let's see, there. I think he's talking to someone else here, but he says, 
What? Do, do, do. He says, I wanted to add that on my Sony HD one back in the day. Okay, he's talking to Not Alone. Um, let's see here. Chris is asking how you mount a power bank to a cheese plate. He's tried Velcro, bongo ties, that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually a adapter from Small Rig. I wish I had it out right now, but all my gear is like in the closet here. But there's a little adapter that Small Rig sells that allows you to put a power bank on any rig. And it's perfect because it's kind of like tension based. It's hard to explain, but basically you can like slide it in and then it'll grip down onto it and keep it really nice and tight. I've shown it on other camera rig builds on this channel, my Fujifilm X-T4 camera rig build. If you go back on the channel and check that out, I have it linked on there, but it's a little USB power bank, uh, power bank like little adapter that'll clamp down onto your power bank. And you can just like screw that right onto your rig on the side, on the back, whatever it is. And it works great, it looks nice. You don't have to use like Velcro or anything like that or bongo ties. Check that out. I'll see if I can link it later. All right. Um, yeah, looks like you guys are talking more about that. And Colton Photography saying, be careful with that focus monitor. I've got two dead ones due to broken LCDs and small HD can't even get replacement screens for them to repair them. Yeah, man, that sucks. I Hopefully, uh, hopefully you can get them repaired or something because... I'd be very sad. This is really one of my favorite monitors. I was talking about this earlier in the channel or earlier in the video um, that I can't find the small HD Focus 5 anymore. If I think they might have discontinued it. I can't find it on their website, b and Adora Adorama, anything like that. I think it might be discontinued, sadly, because it's really one of the best monitors they ever made. So I'm going to be very careful with it not to break it. That's why I've got a cage on it, at least to help protect it a little bit more. Um, yeah, it's one of my go-tos when I don't need an external recorder. So hopefully you can find a way to get yours fixed. Um, let's see here. Try and finish up um, getting to the rest of your guys' comments. We've been going for almost an hour straight here. Um, but yeah, one more thing that I will say improves your camera and rigging can really improve it. Like I was just talking about is of course a camera cage. This kind of goes without saying, but it's really protection for your camera itself. So anything you can do to protect your equipment and keep it from getting trashed from a lot of travel and work and fast pace, you know, quick run and gun stuff that I know a lot of us do. It's great to have a camera cage on there. If you're just running with the body itself, it's going to get a lot more scratches on it. I've resold a ton of my cameras. I've owned a lot of different bodies over the years. And almost every time I sell one, it's flawless. There's no scratches, dents, dings, anything like that because the camera cage really protected it for the whole life cycle of it. So even for just that alone, it's gonna help the resale value of your camera by having a cage on there. So I always recommend it. Even when I'm doing photography, if I don't rig it out at all, because I usually don't with photography, I'll keep the cage on there because it protects the camera and it gives me a little bit more spaces to grip onto. So yeah, put a cage on there. It's definitely gonna help your camera rig a lot. Um, let's see here. Juan Camilo says, hey, love your channel. I just discovered it. I've been learning a lot and my workflow has been getting better. Greetings from Colombia, Dude, welcome to the channel, man. It's great to have you. Um, it's, it's awesome that you're making your own rig. I hope that you know the different rig videos have helped you out. Um, I really appreciate that. So thank you guys so much for for subscribing, liking, everything like that. It really helps and keeps me motivated to keep making these videos. I love hanging out with you guys just on these simple live streams. Um, Colton Photography saying, uh, yeah, can't they are fully discontinued because of the lack of screens? Oh, okay, talking about the small HD focus saying, can't get them fixed because it's discontinued. Yeah, I don't know when they discontinued it. I literally just looked for looked at buying a new one last week and I couldn't find one. So it really sucks they discontinued it. I'll just stick with the Atomos Ninja V. And now I guess my like go-to recommendation for a monitor is probably gonna be the Atomos Shinobi if you don't need an external recording. All right. Um, oh, he's saying that they confirmed this with me and they also had an issue with the screen wasn't super strong. Okay, so maybe that's part of why they discontinued it. Um, Chris Flores Media, what's up? He says, how would you mount a recorder to a rig? I'm trying to rig my Tascam to my A7C rig. Yeah, so those audio recorders are usually a lot larger. They can be difficult to rig. What I see a ton of guys do is they'll get the Tascam with a cage, small rig, and other companies 
sell them with little cages. That's gonna be the best way to mount it. So get a cage, and then I see a lot of people actually mount their audio recorders right underneath the camera because they're a similar size to the body, usually rectangular, square. Put it underneath and mount your camera on top of it, and then have the tripod plate underneath the audio module. So you can have all your audio plug in right underneath. I've seen a lot of guys do that. It seems to work pretty well. If I weren't to do that, I would still use a cage and then I would use 15 millimeter rods and put like a little cheese plate or anything on the back that has um, quarter 20 threads on it on the 15 mil rods and then screw it into that on the back of 15 mil rods. If you guys have suggestions for him, definitely leave them below. That's how I would do it. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. Definitely look it up. There's guys that have some cool solutions for it. All right. Um, Greg Jones saying, putting a cage on is like putting on a set of armor for your camera. Yeah, exactly. There was the funniest comment on one of my videos on the A7S one rigging it out. And someone said like level, level one character, like fully maxed out 100 armor or something like that. I just thought it was hilarious. I was like, yep, that's pretty much what it is. You just like max it out with all this equipment around it to build it out. Um, build out your character to its max ability. Let's see. Jordan Kelly saying, in the next few months, I want to switch my cage accessories to NATO rail mounts so I can set up and take down quickly. Your M50 video sold me on that. Heck yeah, dude. NATO rail is the way to go. It's just so easy to take things on and off with the NATO rail. Like this side handle here is fully NATO rail. Let's see if I can just unscrew this without, <laughs> without breaking an HDMI cable on the way, but boom. Easy to take on and off. The NATO rail is built right into the side of the cage. So anytime I buy a cage, I always look to see if it has NATO rail. A lot of them don't have NATO rail, so you just gotta keep an eye out for that. It's best to have NATO rail on the top for your top handle. This one didn't have it, so I added a little piece of NATO rail. It had it on the side though. And the other thing I always look for is if it has Arca Swiss. This M50 luckily has Arca Swiss built right into the bottom of the cage. So it's super easy to take on and off of an Arca Swiss mount. I don't add a plate to this. I never add one unless I'm using a Manfrotto tripod. But otherwise, you don't need an extra plate. It's got that Arca Swiss. So those are things to look for in a cage. For me, it's a NATO rail and Arca Swiss if I can get it. All right. Um, Brian Barraha saying, Chad, can you interview Zeke about Magic Lantern? Yeah, I'll have to look into that. I haven't used Magic Lantern at all. Um, see if I can find out more. See what Zeke knows about Magic Lantern. So that'd be cool. Um, Camacho Films says, is the small rig cage for monitors? Yes, so this little small rig cage on my small HD Focus um, obviously fully protects it, helps protect the screen in case it were to like hit down because it's raised. So yeah, you can find typically cages for most monitors. I have one on my Atomos Ninja V, the small HD. Um, small rig is really good about making them for the more popular monitors out there. All right. Greg Jones saying that he mounted his recorder, his audio recorder, to the bottom. So yeah, I think that's a good way to do it, um, going back to one of the earlier questions from Chris. All right, um, let's see here. Chris Polk saying that he would watch that, talking about an interview with Zeke on Magic Lantern. I'm gonna have to look into that, see what we can do. I like bringing people onto my live streams and doing interviews with them. Sometimes they don't get as much engagement because it's just me and the other person talking and we don't get to communicate with the audience as much but i would love to do that that would be cool um colton photography saying the key being it boots faster more frame rate options all the broadcast friendly codecs more audio options okay so talking about recording audio externally very cool so yeah we've been running for about an hour now i think i've gotten to pretty much just about all of your questions, comments. I really appreciate it. Again, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Make sure you hit like um, if you've been watching. It's so great to hang out with you guys, be a part of the filmmaking video community. I love it. I love engaging with all you guys all around the world. It's really cool. So yeah, hopefully you have taken away something from this and realized that rigging out your camera really can make it a better camera, help you get better footage. That's why I do it every time and I'm gonna continue to rig out every camera that I get in the future. And on this channel, I'll continue to show you guys more camera rig builds to hopefully inspire you with how you can build yours better, do it you know, as affordable as possible, quick to take apart, put back together, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, final things, I'll just look at the last comments and then we're gonna sign off on here so I can go to bed and you guys can go on your way, so. 
Chris Polk saying, watch out for some cages with integrated NATO rail and the style of NATO clamp. Nicey rigs cage will not work with most small rig handles. Okay, yeah, good to know. Um, NATO rail obviously can be a little bit different on some of them, so you want to make sure that it's going to fit. Um, 